Luke 9 and verse 18. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, keep in mind this is right after the feeding of the 5,000 in Luke's account. As he was praying alone, the disciples were with him and he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. Oh, but others say Elijah and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. The Christ of God. One day, um, when my brother John, some of you are acquainted with, was 15 years old and I was one year older, John got a hold of the family car keys when mom and dad were gone. I don't remember where they were or why they happened to be gone, but they were. And he got a hold of the keys and decided to help himself to a ride in dad's brand new 1965 Ford station wagon, baby blue, beautiful new car. Naturally, his sin found him out. It found him out when he backed into a fence at the local hangout for high school kids, the Dairy Queen in our town, <clears throat> and put a huge scratch along the side of that rear fender. Well, it wasn't long before I found out. In fact, he came whining to me. So we connived to try and save his miserable skin. Somehow, and I don't know to this day how we did this, but we found some fast body shop that could do this right away. It cost us every penny we could find, but we got that car fixed, believe it or not, before mom and dad got home. We told them about it <clears throat> years later. Um, <laughs> years later. But we learned a very important lesson. We learned that big trouble means big cost. Big holes I mean a big price to be paid. And the Bible teaches that man's been in a deep hole ever since the fall of Adam and Eve. We're born there. Don't have to do anything to get there. It just comes with being human. We have sin as our birthright, and then we make our daily and minute-by-minute -minute contributions. If, if, I think it was John Bunyan. This isn't in the manuscripts. That's when I always get messed up. But I think it was Bunyan who said, even my prayers have enough sin in them to send me to hell. <clears throat> and he was right as we sit here. Our thoughts take us places where we shouldn't be. We sin constantly, beloved. And, and we just don't, we don't see it the same way God does. But because God is God, he knows. And he sees. And he understands. And it's a deep hole that we're in. And it cost to get out. The solution is very costly. That's what the passage is about from verses 18 through 27 in Luke 9. Now with the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus' ministry kind of reaches its apex, if you will, from a human perspective. You remember the popularity is an all-time high. The people having been fed this food come and want to make Jesus king. He sees right through this. He knows all they really want is more bread, and he tells them what you really need is the bread of life, that which is, by the way, me, which you get by means of repentance. And John 6, verse 60 tells us that after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They wanted nothing to do with that part of it. And so from this point, things are going to begin to go down. He came to seek and to save that which was lost, but he found that many of the lost didn't want to be saved. Not at the cost that has to be paid. So this passage teaches us the cost of being truly saved. And I know you've been taught all your life that it's free. And it is in a sense, but beloved, there's a huge cost that attaches to this. And we need to understand this. The crowds are still there as Jesus begins this ministry, but the enthusiasm is waning. And so he begins to concentrate on his disciples. And we'll see this as we go from here through the rest of the chapters in Luke. There's still crowds, but often he's aiming at his disciples. Here, 
He takes them, although our passage doesn't tell this, he takes them 40 miles north of the Sea of Galilee up to a place called uh, Caesarea Philippi to have a conversation with them. The conversation that we read about this morning. He needs to teach them about saving faith and about the cost that attaches to that. Without help, some kind of outside in, intervention we can't escape the fallen nature that we're born with that's taking us straight to hell without that help. And so Jesus is going to tell us there is help, but, this, but the salvation that you need is costly. And he wants to make sure everyone understands, particularly the disciples, the cost that attaches. There's a cost to God the Father. There's a cost to Jesus, God the Son. And there is a cost to us. So we're going to look at this passage over the next few weeks using three questions to deal with the cost at each stage of development here. Who is Jesus is the first question, and we'll see the cost to the Father as we look at that today. Then in succeeding weeks, we'll look at what did Jesus do, the cost to him, and then what must I do, the cost to me. So today, who is Jesus? Jesus, what is the cost to the Father? Look at verse 18 again. Now it happened that as he was praying, the disciples were with him and he asked them, what, who do the crowds say that I am? Here is history's most significant question. We've seen it before, but the most significant question that we can ever be faced with is who is Jesus? It always reminds me a little bit you can tell where my mind goes sometimes of the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Do you remember that? Butch Cassidy and Sundance were used to robbing banks and getting away with no problem. They could escape any posse that came along. But the railroad, after they'd had enough of this, went out and hired the, the best ringers they could find, right? And they brought them all in. And after they've robbed a certain bank, here's Butch and Sundance trying to get away. And every time they look back over the rocks thinking, surely we've lost them by now. They are just keep right on coming. Here they come. And pretty soon, every time they look over the rocks, Butch is saying, who are those guys? Who are we dealing with here? That's the question, beloved, that we have to ask about Jesus. Every person who ever lives must deal with this question, who is Jesus? Who is this guy? Luke is constantly putting this question in front of Theophilus, the man to whom he's writing. He does it by means of the birth narrative that he gives. This is a virgin birth, an, amazingly, an amazing birth unique in history, raising the question, who is this person? In chapter 5, when Jesus forgives the sins of the paralytic and heals him, what's the question that the Pharisees are asking? Who can forgive sins except God alone? When Jesus attacks their Sabbath traditions, they are asking, well, who are you to tell us what's right and wrong? John asks from prison, if you recall, who exactly are you? This isn't what I expected. When Jesus calms the storm. Remember what the disciples said when it was all over with? They said, who then is this? Herod asks in chapter 9, verse 9, who is this? And now Jesus himself raises the same question. Why? Why this question? Because, beloved, this question differentiates. Here is the question that determines where we will spend eternity. This is the question. Who is Jesus? And so Jesus raises it as well. It's the most, in question, most important question in life that you or I will ever face. And when the day comes, as it, as it will at some point in time, if it hasn't already in our life, where we're saying, final answer, here's my assessment of who Jesus is. You can't afford to be wrong. So we want to use all of our lifelines, use all of your investigative skills, use everything you can to make sure you have the right answer to this question and the implications of it. Who is Jesus? 
Jesus asked it two different ways in this passage. He asked, first of all, who do men say that I am? And then he asked, turns to the disciples and says, well, but who do you say that I am? And out of the answers that are given, we see three things that we need to know about who Jesus is. First of all, Jesus is a man. Jesus is a man. Look at the middle of verse 18 again. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah. And others that one of the prophets of old has arisen. The crowds, in other words, aren't quite sure. Most of them said John the Baptist. He was the most recent one on the scene. Or even a resurrected prophet, but still just a man. They knew he was a man. They had all the evidence that he was a man. They had seen him. They'd seen him sweat. They'd seen him be hungry. They'd seen him be tired. They'd seen him be jostled around. They'd heard him speak. They had touched him. They knew he was a man. They didn't miss that part. And they knew he was a great man, but only a man. Now, in this, they were partly right. Jesus was a man. He wasn't one of the ones that they suggested, but he was a man. One of the most amazing things about Jesus is that he was a man. But here's the question we have to ask. If Jesus is truly also God, as we'll see in a moment, why? Why did he become a man? Why did he take on human flesh? Three answers that I want to look at this morning. This isn't the only three, but these three are particularly relevant to this passage of Scripture. So I want you to see these. Number one, he became a man to qualify as a sacrifice for sin. To qualify as a sacrifice for sin. We don't like the sin, the word sin these days, but it's the reason that we're in the hole we're in. Right? And so we need to know this word sin and we need to understand what it means. And Jesus came specifically to deal with that particular issue. Sin, according to the Bible, violates the character of God. Therefore, every sin has to be paid for from the smallest thought that goes astray to the most vile deed that you can imagine and that you can think of. It all has to be paid for. And the only way that we can pay for our sin against an infinite God is by infinite separation from Him. It's the only way. So the only answer is a substitute. There must be a substitute. But the substitute has to be perfect. Substitute has to be perfect. God begins to teach this very early in the Old Testament. Remember how the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, remember? And they had the, the plagues that kept going on so that Pharaoh would finally let them go. And you remember the last plague was that all the firstborn in the land, men, women, children, animals, whatever, would die unless there was blood on the doorposts of, the, of any particular home. And in that case, the angel of death would pass over that particular place. But there was something else. It wasn't just blood that had to be there. Exodus 12, verse 5, God says this, your lamb shall be without blemish. It couldn't be just blood. It had to be flawless blood, if I can use that term. It couldn't be the runt of the litter of the lambs, the one you'd want to get rid of anyway. It couldn't be the one that just broke its leg a couple days ago. It had to be perfect. Now there was God beginning to teach a lesson right there. See, the word without blemish that's used there is used 51 times in the Old Testament. 51. Think God's trying to make a point? Has to be without blemish. The sacrifice has to be Perfect sin means sacrifice, and the sacrifice have to be, has to be perfect. That, beloved, is what, the, is what the earthly life of Jesus was all about. That's why 30 years before he does anything else was to demonstrate the perfection of his life. We'll see next, next time we're together, we'll, we'll see the, some of the implications of that, but the... But the the perfection had to be there, and that's what Jesus was doing in the 30 years that he lived here. Before he could die for sin, he had to live without sin. 
And so that 30 years was the time during which he was being tempted in all points just like we are and yet without sin. So Jesus became qualified as the Lamb of God. Not one of, but the Lamb of God. The one who would end all the sacrificial systems because finally he would take upon himself once and for all in reality the sin of the world. Jesus did what no other person has ever done. He lived a sinless existence. In Hebrews 4.15, he in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Hebrews 9.14, he offered himself without blemish to God. Peter says in 1 Peter 1.19 that we are ransomed by the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Peter's testimony, of course, is the testimony of a man who had watched Jesus like a hawk for three years. He knew whether he had sinned or not, knew him to be sinless, the perfect and only sacrifice for sin. But he had to be a man in order to qualify as the second Adam to accomplish what the first Adam had failed to do. Secondly, he had to become a man to become a sacrifice for sin. God's standard is pretty high, right? It turns out that a human being in our own strength and in our own abilities can't meet the standard. We can't meet the standard of perfection. And so if there's going to be a sacrifice and a substitute, it really has to be God. But God can't die. So what has to happen? Well, God's, you can see the beauty and the perfection of God's plan. He became a man so that he could experience death through the human nature that Jesus had. This is, in a sense, God dying for you. I mean, let that grip you for a moment. But he had to be a man in order to do that. You know, the God is dead. God can't die. The God is dead. Theologians of the 60s were a little, as my British friends would say, they were a little previous. They had it a little... Beforehand, God hasn't died, God can't die, God won't die. But he sent his son in the form of a human being in order to experience death on our behalf. Hebrews again, chapter 2, verse 9, says it this way. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, that is, he became a man, namely Jesus, we see him crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. That's what Jesus did. He became a man so that he could die to be the sacrifice for sin. Third thing that Jesus had to become a man to do is that, and that is so that he could judge sin, so that he could judge sin the day has to come when those who reject Christ will be standing before him in judgment. See, Jesus, Jesus has to be one of two things to each one of us. He's either our savior or he's our judge. He's one or the other. As we sit here this morning, if we were to die right now, somehow your heart just stops. Jesus is either your savior or he's your judge. He's got to be one or the other. The Bible tells us this, John 5, 22. Kind of going through these today rather than have you look them all up, so hang in there. But John 5, 22, the Father judges no man but has given all judgment to the Son. Hebrews, or Acts chapter 10, verse 42. Peter says, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Can you see how Jesus' life equips him to be the judge? Nobody can say, you don't know what it's like. See, because Jesus knows exactly what it's like. Can't stand before him and say, hey, you don't know. This was tougher than anybody could do. Oh, no. Jesus knows. You, you know, if you think about this, it, it just makes sense. You, you, you don't take a farmer and, and, and tell him, I want you to come over here and judge how this brain surgeon is doing, right? Brain surgeon might say, I, that's not fair. You don't take a rocket scientist and put him over here to judge how this third grade teacher is doing, right? Unfair. 
Jesus, who died to be our Savior, but if we turn him down, will become our judge, has been created such that no one will ever be able to say to him, it's unfair. You just don't know. Because he does know. So he was qualified to be our judge because he became a man. How much better if we would let him be our savior. So Jesus is a man. Secondly, from this passage, Jesus is God's man. Jesus is God's man. The crowds were right, Jesus is a man, but they made a fatal error. They stopped short. They stopped short. They intended the comparisons with ancient prophets to be a compliment, right? That was their intention. They thought they were complimenting him, but when he claimed to be more than a man, Every time that comes up in the Bible, they try to kill him right then and there. It took him a while to actually accomplish it. We find him in John 8 and in John 10 and other places, they try to kill him. When they finally realize that he's claiming to be more than a man, they wanted nothing to do with him as more. They were perfectly happy with Jesus as a man, perfectly happy with him as a great prophet, perfectly happy with him as someone who would meet their needs and heal their bodies and provide food. But as something more than that, they wanted nothing to do with them. Why? Because they realized that if he was more than a man, it made a claim on their life. They didn't want accountability. Just like people today don't want to be accountable. We like to think I'm my own person. I'm answerable only to me. And of course, the message of the Bible is, no, we're all answerable to a great, almighty, and perfect God. The solution these people came up with was simply to deny that he was more than a man. Same solution is still in vogue today. Most people are very happy to talk about Jesus as a man. But they won't have him as God. Why? Because we don't want to be accountable and so we deny the deity of Christ. But beloved, denying what's true doesn't make it untrue, right? Denying Jesus' deity doesn't make him un-God any more than denying that the snow is white turns it to a different color. So Jesus turns in verse 20 and he says this, but who do you say that I am. And the word you there is emphatic. Jesus is saying, okay, you've told me about the crowds, but what I really want to know is, what do you think? Who do you say that I am? Now listen, Jesus is not having some kind of identity crisis here, right? He's not, he's not seeking information. He's not trying to find out who he really is. He's not trying to find himself. He already knows who he is, but he knows how important it is that they know who he is. That's why, if you go back to verse 18, you find the first thing that's going on in this passage is what? He's praying. Why is he praying? Because he knows how important it is that these men understand who he is, and he knows how difficult this is to grasp that this person that I talk to and shake hands with and eat meals with and do all this stuff with is actually God in the flesh. That's tough. And so he's praying that the Father will reveal this to them along with all the other things that he's done to show them. And that prayer is is answered. Because notice what happens here. The prayer is answered when Peter jumps in as the spokesman for the group and he says, we know who you are. You're the Christ of God. You're the Christ of God. You're the Christ, the Messiah of God. Jesus says in Matthew, Matthew gives us an expanded version of this. In Matthew 16, verse 17, Jesus says to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father. My Father. That's where you got this. Jesus prayed, the Father answered, and Peter has an understanding that he perhaps didn't have before. It says, you're the Christ of God. Now let's look first of all at the word Christ. The word Christ translates the Old Testament word Mashiach. Mashiach, Messiah, which means the anointed one. 
Now, in the Old Testament, we see we find three different kinds of people being anointed, right? Prophets are anointed, priests are anointed, and kings are anointed. So all three of them are anointed. And as the sacrificial system under Moses comes into play, you can't be more than, you can't be a priest and a king simultaneously, for example. But the Bible is teaching all the way through the Old Testament, there's going to come one who's going to be the ultimate anointed one. And the Jews were looking for that. They were expecting an ultimate anointed one. They were expecting a Messiah who would be all three rolled into one. Prophet, priest, and king. In calling Jesus Messiah, here's what's happening. Peter is actually acknowledging that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He's acknowledging essentially, Jesus, I understand, you're the one from Genesis 3.15 who's going to bruise the head of the serpent, Satan. You're the one from Genesis 49, verse 10, who's going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah, from whom the scepter of kingship will never depart. You're the one who's going to be the ultimate son of David from 2 Samuel 7, verse 13, who will sit on the throne of David forever. I understand that you're the one in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, who will be the son of man, who will be given dominion forever everlasting dominion. Yes, there's the reason that it says son of man, because he was, but no man could do this everlasting. Do you see that even in the Old Testament, there was the hint, and now, Jesus, Jesus, now Peter is looking straight at Jesus and saying, I, I, I see it now, you're the, you're the one. I'm seeing why you like that title, son of man. He's saying, I know that you're the prophet of Isaiah, the, the suffering servant of Isaiah 61, who brings good news to the poor, liberty to the captives and sight to the blind. I see that you're the one. You're the one that we've been looking for. Jesus, you're the one. You're the Messiah of God. You do some strange things now and then. You say some strange things now and then. We don't always get it. But we get you. You're the one. You're the one we've been looking for. You're the one that God promised to send. You are God's man. Suppose I sent you to the airport and said, I need you to pick up a friend of mine. You say, ah, oh, am I going to know him? He's going to be wearing green. Oh, maybe that'll work, right? So you go to the airport, but, you know, if 250 soldiers get off the same plane, you could be in trouble, right? Might not find him. But if I say he's going to be, he's going to have a green coat on, uh, he's, he's got blonde hair, he's got a beard, he's got glasses, he's about six foot two, weighs about 190 pounds, he'll have a... He'll have a, a green beret on. He'll have his little daughter with him. She looks kind of like, like Anna. She's, she's, she's a little blonde haired. She'll have a little pink thing in her hair. Probably you're going to be able to find him, right? It won't, won't be any mistake. But this is, do you see this is exactly what all those prophecies in the Old Testament are doing? They're pointing you directly to the person of Jesus Christ. 300 plus of them accomplished in his first coming. God wants us to know that's the one. And so when Peter says, you're the Messiah of God, that's what he's saying. We get it. You've described him in detail and here he is. He's in a lot of ways different than we thought he would be. Doesn't act like we thought he would act. Doesn't do a lot of the things we thought he would do, but he meets the criteria perfectly. You're the Christ of God. So before you begin to reject Christ, my advice is look really, really hard. Some of the most effective ways to help lead others to Christ is to get acquainted with what the Old Testament teaches about him and the results are amazing. The results are amazing. Things like testifying that he's going to be crucified, you know, from Psalm 22, a thousand years before it was ever used. Things like being sold for 30 pieces of silver. Things like his clothes being divided. I mean, there's just prophecy after prophecy in the Old Testament that's fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And, 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 and so many times... When I've been able to share those with people, they say, wow, I, 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 I didn't know that. 
begins to give credibility to the Bible and to the whole story that's here. Jesus is God's man. But we gotta go one more step, beloved. Jesus is not just God's man. Jesus is the God man. Jesus is the God man. You say, what do you mean by that? We mean by that that Jesus isn't just man, he is. He isn't just God's man, Messiah, he is. But he's the God man. He's the one who is 100% man and 100% God in one unique person, completely unique in history. There's never been anybody like Jesus, never, ever, anyone like Christ. Fully God, fully man, revealed in one person, no lesser definition will do. Who is Jesus? He's the God-man. The Jews missed this. They were looking for a Messiah. You know that if you've studied the Bible at all. But what they missed was the fact that Messiah wasn't just going to be a man when he came. Never dawned on them, really, that he would be God in the flesh. Very few of them kind of got this because there were enough hints in the Old Testament you could kind of pick it up but most of them missed this completely. And so they didn't get it, but the the disciples are gradually being able to get this. This isn't just a man and it's not just Messiah, but this is God in the flesh. When Peter said, you are the Christ in, in, in Matthew 16, the fuller expression of this, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. In calling Jesus the son of the living God, he was making him equal with God. Say, how do you know that? Well, because all the way through the Gospels, we see this. In John chapter 5, verse 18. In fact, let's let's take a little time and turn to a couple of these. John 5, verse 18. So you can see this. Over and over, this happens. Sometimes we look over it, but in John 5, verse 18, we read this. It says, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, which is, as we've seen, seemed to be the favorite thing that he did and the favorite thing the Pharisees like to pick on him for. But not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The people sometimes understood it better than some of the disciples. They understood that when Jesus said, made these claims that he was claiming to be equal with God. It, w- it was that constant claim to be God that eventually got Jesus killed. There's a lot of people that try and claim other things, you know, that he was politically incorrect and that's what got him killed and he took up the cause of the disenfranchised and that's what got him killed and he got on the wrong side of the Jews and the Romans and that's what's got him killed. Listen, the thing that got Jesus killed was the claim to be God. You've got to understand that. And he did it on purpose. It was part of the plan. Jesus forced the issue, if you will. He just kept on when he had plenty of opportunity to back away until they finally killed him. It happens throughout the Gospels. But look at this. Back up now to to the book of Mark. If you're in John, just go past Luke and go to Mark. Chapter 14, right near the end. Mark verse, chapter 14 and verse 61. This is, this is the night that Jesus has been betrayed and so he's on trial. Mark 14, verse 61, it says, but he remained silent and made no answer. And so again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the blessed Why is he asking that? Because he knows Jesus has been claiming this over and over and over again. Are you? And Jesus said, I am. And you all know that I am is the Old Testament name for God, for Jehovah. I am. And then he adds, you will see the Son of Man, the Daniel 7, 13, and 14 person who's going to have everlasting dominion. You're going to see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Listen, not only am I, not only am I the Messiah, not only am I the Son of the Blessed, but you're going to see me one of these days a whole lot differently than you're seeing me right at this moment. It's a warning. It's an invitation to repent. 
You're going to see the Son of Man coming in power in the clouds of heaven, and the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. Why? Because he broke the Sabbath? No. Because he helped some poor people? No. Because he claimed to be God. That's why. Claimed to be who he really was. And so they killed him. So, beloved, let me say, if you consign Jesus to mere manhood, you've been tragically misled. That's what the whole of the gospel record is about, to show that this is the Christ, the Son of God. We read in John 10, verse 31, it says, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered, I have shown you many good works from my Father. For which one of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus would have been a fool if he went down this path and didn't have to. He'd have been a fool or a liar or a deceiver or worse if he's making this claim. He makes this claim because it's true, and this is the very reason, beloved, that he will either be your Lord or he will be your judge. It's one or the other. I love how C.S. Lewis puts it. I'm sure I've used this before, but it's very appropriate to our message today. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. <clears throat> he would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. If you don't get anything else out of this today, I hope you get that. Jesus didn't intend to leave the option that he's just a great man. Who is Christ? Why does it matter? Jesus says in John 17, beginning in verse three, this is eternal life. Now listen, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do, and now, Father, Glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. To be truly saved is to accept God's gift of life paid for, paid for by the life of his own son. And one other point, and we're done. I've heard some people say, well, that was unfair. For God the Father to send his son to go through all this humiliation and this turmoil and this death. What's fair about that? And I want you to understand very clearly before we leave here what the price was to the father to send his son. And I'm going to use an illustration. It's a tough illustration, but you need to know this. You need to feel this. You need to in the depths of your being, understand what God the Father went through as he sent his son to pay the price for your sin. There's a man named John Griffiths. Lived in the 1930s. He controlled the great railroad bridge that spanned the Mississippi River. It was a drawbridge. One day in 1937, he took his eight-year-old son, Greg, with him to work. At noon, John lifted the bridge to allow the ships to go through. And then he ate lunch with his son Greg on the deck, but they were having fun, they were talking, they were, you know, it was a good time, and 
time got away and all of a sudden John heard the whistle for the 107 Memphis Express coming his way and, and the drawbridge is still up. So he rushed up to the control tower to put the bridge down in time to put the train to safety. But as he looked down to look for his ships, he saw that his son Greg had fallen down into the mechanisms that controlled the bridge. And his leg was caught between two big cogs down there and he couldn't get out. So you can imagine his father in his mind, he's going through, what am I going to do? What can I do? There's no time to rush down and get him. He shouts to his son. He says, son, pull yourself out. And his son can't do it. He's trying, he's crying, and he can't get out. And so now John Griffiths is faced with the, what am I going to do? Am I going to put the bridge down and kill my son? Or am I going to save him and kill the 400 people that are coming on this train? Sobbing hysterically, John pushed the master switch forward. And the great bridge lowered just in time to allow the train to cross. John watched as the train rolled by with businessmen reading papers, fancily dressed women dripping, sipping tea, people going back and forth with one car to another, none having a clue of what it cost that they were now living. That's what God, the Father, experienced when he sent his son to pay the penalty for our sins, beloved. Lamentations 1 verse 12 has a great verse that I think we need to remember. It says, is it nothing to you all who pass by? How many people just pass by? Jesus is just a word. Jesus is just a name. Jesus is just, they don't know for sure what. They never take time to investigate. They're not, they don't really have a clue. And in the meantime, they have no concept of what, it's, what it costs for the Father to send his own son. And so we have to ask, is God sacrificed nothing to you who pass by? Don't just pass by. Understand what the Father has done. Understand what it costs the Father to provide for the salvation that you need and that I need. You know, your answer to the question, who is Jesus? Your answer won't change the reality of who he is. It'll just determine whether when you meet him face to face, shortly, whether he will be your savior or whether he will be your judge. So what's your final answer? Let's pray. Father, this is kind of a heavy message and yet a reminder of the price that's been paid for our salvation. A reminder of what it meant for you to come and live a life as a man and experience the humiliation and then eventually the death that you experienced in our place. What it cost the Father to send you to do that. Lord, my heart is heavy because, because I fear that every week people sit here and <laughs> kind of it goes in one ear and out the other. It's kind of, they've made kind of a commitment. But, but the fact is nothing in their life has ever changed because Jesus came. There's no evidence. There's no real fruit. And I worry that there are those who don't really know you. So Father, I'm just praying one more time. As you revealed to Peter who you were, would you reveal to all of us sitting here today who you are? And would you help us to come to you in repentance, to give you our sin in exchange for the righteousness of Jesus, so that we can be saved. In the quietness of our heart, Lord, I pray that we would make that decision if we've never made it before. And just open our heart and say to you, thank you, Lord, for sending your son to die for me. I see it now in a way I never saw it before. I accept him. I open my heart to him. 
I know some things are gonna have to change in my life as a result of making him Lord, but I want him more than I want those. Thank you for saving me. Thank you that you would do that. Lord, help anyone who's not sure. Lord, give them the courage to come and say, I- I'm not sure. Could you, could you point me in a direction? Could you give me something to help me? Would you mind sharing in the Bible a little more about this? Can I ask you some questions? Lord, we wouldn't attack. We wouldn't do anything that's harmful. We just try to help point them toward you. Give them the courage to do that. So we sing this last little chorus, help it to be the song, as Melody said earlier, coming right straight from our heart. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?